Now I would like to welcome our panel members. We start with Branislav Bian, the CE Business Development Manager of Visa. Welcome. Thank you. I already opened this book for the first time. Josef Gaidos, founder of Axel Gate. Mikhail Simansky, payment system expert at Blick. Peter Strasovets, co-founder and CEO at Payout. Gauger Stefanek, sales executive at Tekna. And Dr. Daniel Kuringer, CEO of Maltevo. The format of the panel discussions, each member will give an opening statement on a generic question, and the question is, future of payment services transforming financial transactions in a connected world. And your comments on that, please. We'll start with Dr. Daniel Kuringer, the CEO of Mount the Wolf, please. Yes, thank you very much uh, for this discussion. I think it's a very important topic right now to talk about this uh, about the financial infrastructure in the world because uh, from my point of view, the future of payments uh, is crucial because um, a lot of traditional uh, institutions uh, are no longer focusing on this daily business, on this daily usage of money. And we see and we understand that the global payments are getting more and more difficult. and especially um, when having a look at SEPA, SWIFT, and so on, uh, it's getting more and more difficult to make global transfers. Uh, this is one of our points uh, we tried to solve, and we were combining and connecting fiat and crypto. We are a virtual payment pro uh, provider with a connected uh, exchange. That means we are using for different payment solutions uh, different currencies in order to have a safe global transfer of money. And I think this will be uh, a very important topic for the future to be compliant, to be uh, fast, to be safe, and to reach the right target. That's more or less the future of, or from my point of view, the future of payment. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Puringer. Now the word goes to Branislav Beer, CE, Business Development Manager at Visa. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, I would actually agree to uh, what you just said. Um, I think that we need to work on embedding and making uh, transfers simpler, cheaper, uh, more reliable. Um, more, if we go a little bit down to, to earth of like what it will look like in near future, I think we'll not, as a person, we will not make payments. It will not be physical uh, uh, function, me putting card on, on card reader. That's past. What will happen is your machines will order stuff, um, uh, I will go to the shop, pick up stuff, and leave. So physically, we will not have the transaction. What we will be, we will be controllers of those transactions. And here comes actually uh, greatness of innovation and, uh, and uh, bringing new ideas. Because we, whoever will be the best in providing me the picture what I have done with my transactions to understand, to manage, to control, is the gonna be the winner, right? So here I'm talking about uh, good design of applications. So I understand I have done 300 transactions a month and it gives me kind of clear idea what that means. Where I spend on bus, where I spend for food, restaurants and so on and forth. So this is like uh, how we see the future. Thank you, Branislav. And now the word goes to Mikhail Simanski, payment system expert at Blink. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to, to see that from, from a little bit different angle. So 
I think that the forces which are shaping the industry will exactly work in, in future. And uh, I, I would name four of those. That's uh, competition, that's regulation, uh, there are very strong network effects, and there are interoperability challenges slash standardization. And uh, they are working together and, uh, and uh, creating the, 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 the future. We, sh we can be an example that, uh, as bleak, that competition works. Uh, because uh, we were uh, founded in 2015 as a fintech basically and as a new uh, payment method and a new payment system which is very was very ambitious and we are extremely successful with more than 1 billion payments uh, processed annually uh, but definitely when we see the european or global picture there is a lot uh, of uh, regulation and obstacles to uh, provide uh, cross-border solutions even with uh, such simple uh, products like P2P uh, in EMSA. Uh, we work on that, but definitely uh, it is not simple with all those AML regulations and etc. Uh, so uh, yes, we'll, uh, definitely we are going in the right direction, but from my experience I think that Generally, as an industry, we have a lot uh, to do uh, to provide better services uh, of a global reach. And just to finish, I think that trying to be objective, as a payment industry, we are a little bit behind uh, the rest of, of, of the, the industry. So I can text any person in the world now without any problem, and I couldn't immediately send money to any person uh, in the world. So probably the expectations, especially of a younger generation, are high and we are here to, uh, f to, 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 to fulfill them. Thank you. Thank you. And another word goes to Peter Strasovets. Thank you very much. Uh, hello again. Uh, I would just tell that future of finance is embedded invisible and fully automated. And I will build on top of what my colleagues told that, yes, uh, indeed as Branislav told, that in B2C, uh, most of us wouldn't touch the money in future, in the very near future, or we don't even now. What we are doing as a company, we are embedding payments for B2Bs into their systems. So our companies, our corporates, they don't even touch money in the sense as they did. They don't export import files. They don't go to banks. Everything is embedded. Bank 400 and everything works fully automated. Our credo is that we enable our clients to work with money as with data. What we did in uh, 20, 20 years ago that we started instead of just storing data to automate them, to understand them via BI, to be in control, we enable to do the same with money. And thanks to that, money is a transparent asset where it's not just storing and using it as the value, and we can benefit and grow business uh, thanks to embedding all the money-related uh, aspects into our systems. Uh, we could discuss if it is now possible, easy, with crypto, for example, to, do, to send transactions to whoever all around the world, or it's problematic due to actual state of regulation. I believe we will touch these topics. But still, for the future, the full transparency, automation, and control for the safety of the transfers is what needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And Josef Gaidos, founder of Axelgate. Thank you for having me. Uh, happy to be here. So, yeah, there are a lot of things that are uh, shaping uh, the payments. Uh, I try to look at it from the consumer point of view, and there is a, a clear trend for making the payments uh, seamless and, and as convenient as possible. And uh, uh, one area that uh, I'm interested in is uh, uh, how the payments will uh, adapt to the evolution of uh, mobile devices or more precisely screens. Uh, we see that, uh, well, it's hard to say if, the, if our mobile devices that we currently have reached the like top of uh, the uh, evolution because there wasn't much change 
in the smartphones in the past couple of years. But we also see that, uh, for example, Apple is coming with Vision iOS. So that would be kind of interesting to see how payments will adapt to these new uh, uh, changes in, in, in the screens. So that would be all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Josef. And the word goes to Gabriel Stefanik, sales executive at TechTap. Thank you, Johan. Thanks, everyone, and thank you for having me. When I look here, I think I probably represent uh, the younger generation, although at the age of 33, sometimes when I speak to early 20-year-olds, I feel like an old granny or grandfather. Uh, I think, you know, as the population ages, uh, we have to pay attention uh, to trends and also to what the customer is saying, and it's just logical that uh, in a couple decades, uh, you know, the main players on the markets will be the 20 year olds. And uh, of course, even nowadays, they require payments uh, to be instant, uh, seamless, and flawless. So, probably we'll have to, uh, we have to also pay attention to this trend. Uh, I, I live in Latvia for the last nine years, and uh, at DECTA, we are providing technologies for, for digital banks, mostly neo banks, and that's a region where. Uh, the neo banks are quite prevalent because uh, the central bank of Lithuania has been having this sort of business model of um, releasing licenses uh, for these neo banks, which are basically they come from uh, all over Europe, but they all have the license uh, from Lithuania, and they are the ones who innovate and try to service uh, uh, the younger generation and also the younger generation of entrepreneurs who don't necessarily need to be banked with the legacy banking uh, players and uh, they prefer you know, the innovative, more flexible uh, neobanks uh, who provide uh, FASEPA payments uh, for a few years already and focus on innovation. So I think uh, it's uh, one trend uh, we have to pay attention to, and also, also in payments. Thank you very much. And uh, it's interesting you mentioned the generational gap here because there might be a difference between retail customers and commercial customers in their banking, but let's say payments needs in this case, because we're dealing with banking and payments here, and mainly payment services. Will somebody pick up the ball about the difference here between the younger, older generation and commercial banking? Because our younger generation will be the receivers of the commercial banking in the near future. They will be the decision makers, makers in the corporations. Will that lead to changes in corporate banking? Anyone can start on this question. Whoever is interested. So recently I was uh, watching uh, Visa had economist projecting the future because as, as Visa sees the numbers, we can kind of uh, forecast if the economy is going, the worldwide economy basically, is going to the recession or not, because we see. And what he stressed there was really interesting, and it was really the focus on Generation Z and millennials. These are future customers of banks. And if the banks don't have strategies that are actually tackling problems and needs of those people, they will probably fail. So. Uh, this is just an explanation how, how important it is to look at it. I do not see much connection between young generation and B2B payments. I can sense that uh, probably new CEOs of the companies will be millennials, and we can see that. And uh, I, I like the energy that comes from those people, ideas that come from those people. So it's all very positive, uh, but otherwise, uh, a need for transactions for B2B is, is pretty clear to me. Thank you. The word goes to Peter I think the generation gap is a false assumption because if the product is done right and the target audience recognizes the benefits, they will adopt it. For example, touch phones. You all know that your grandma was hesitating to use the touch phone to touch the screen and dial you. But since you have been sending photos of the kids, photos from vacations, no grandparent had issues with touch phones because, wow, it works. And even in B2B, I, I would not go directly to CEO. Let's talk about an accountant. Obviously, new technologies, uh, replacing standard banks, standard bank statements, it's something new, hesitating. 
If you embed it into the accounting platform, into the ERP platform, it's invisible and it just works. It's adapted crazy fast. So if the product is done right, then the gender gap, uh, the age gap, sorry, is not in the place. So no age gap in commercial banking when it comes to payments, it is embedded. Okay, exactly. that's a very good conclusion. What you, what you don't see won't bother you. <laughs> Anybody else want to pick up this ball before we continue? This question? Nobody? Uh, well, I can. Okay. So please, uh, Dr. Dada Puringen. Uh, for me, um, I'm now 40, 45 years old. That means um, I was more or less um, learning from a, four, uh, let's say, 28K modem up to uh, a direct connection to the internet and so on. So although I'm quite young or in the middle age, more or less, uh, I, I saw already a lot of different uh, issues. And it's always... Uh, we as technicians or fintech companies have to take this in mind and we have to, to find solutions and take in mind the different issues younger people have and older people have. In our company, although we are crypto related, we have an average age of our clients of 45 years. That means uh, fintech is not only for the young ones, but I, I completely agree with uh, the others that we have to find solutions which suit for both the young people and the old people, That's or older people. That means uh, there should be a, a way to suit this flow that everybody understands it, that it's easy to do. Uh, taking regulations like, uh, like verification, remotely re uh, um, verification in mind and so on. So this has to suit. Thank you. Maybe the generation gap is not that big because, um, I mean, I'm a typical generation X, okay? <laughs> and we are adapting to the new technology rapidly. Not only me, but almost everybody in generation X do that, independent of education level. Everybody's adapting in this generation because we didn't grow up with the internet, but we saw it when we were still in the forming age. So maybe there is no such generation gap, but we also will appreciate similar solutions as the millennials, Generation Z, Generation Y, and so on. Now, please, Gabriel Stefanek, you have something to say. Uh, I just wanted to add to this <clears throat> because I see it uh, kind of firsthand when we have, as I mentioned, there are many neo banks uh, from the region where I work or have been uh, based uh, for the last nine years. And most of them are using electronic uh, identification uh, forms, you know, when the customer is signing up to be uh, onboarded for the bank. And uh, then the next step is sort of online verification through SAMSUB or other, uh, you know, platforms that provide this uh, very convenient service. And uh, it's just happening uh, time and time again that we have to explain how this works and have to run the clients through the process, whereas when uh, a younger person picks up, who is, uh, you know, picks up this service and he's used to working uh, with a phone from the age of 15, it just sort of seamless and the identification is done, you know, within a few minutes. That That's just uh, my personal experience. Yes, that is very true. When I have a technological problem, I ask my 13-year-old daughter to help me and she's done in five minutes, what takes me two hours to solve myself. And the word now goes to Mikhail Simansky. Yes, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say there is a gap. So what I see uh, from my sons, they, of course, they use the modern technology. Uh, but if they are not, and they are not payment experts, they are not fascinated about banking and the payments, it is just a fact of life. So they pay contactlessly, they use mobile apps, uh, they like Revolut-like experience, and, and they are happy, and, and they don't have any specific expectations on top of that. They, that's, that. they have problems with the old style technology we understand and they don't understand. So for example, my younger son, he, he was totally, couldn't do anything in the post office, traditional post office, sending some letters, etc. cetera, was, was a totally strange experience for him and we had to educate him how to, how to, how to do that. So, so I, I wouldn't say it is a, a, a gap so that we should do something uh, 
very specific to the younger generation. And we should also remember that uh, the population is aging. So we have a different consumer expectations also related to control of payment. So yes, for some of us, automatization is perfect. Others want to feel the control over payments that I should uh, press the button to, 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 to pay because otherwise some people will feel that they are losing control over payments. Yes, control over payments, but also, let's say, for the older generation, we still put our bills into the banking portals or paid every month automatically so we don't have to do it every month and so on. So this would be, that's a very small step of automation. Would be a big different step to automate other payments like retail payments, really? Would that be such a big step psychologically? Exactly. Uh, I would just add that uh, uh, this uh, divide between generations uh, probably exists depending on the, on the use case. You, you uh, mentioned a really good case, for example, these autonomous stores that we saw many brands are, are testing. And uh, there we see that there is a generational gap. Uh, older people don't want to uh, go into a self-checkout store and, and deal with it. They prefer uh, dealing with, uh, with the checkout agent or the, the person who, who is behind the counter. Yeah, many of us probably too. So uh, I agree that there are cases where the generational gap is not that big. Maybe if it's uh, uh, using your smartphone, but there might be use cases where uh, the, the payment providers or merchants really consider uh, if this is uh, including uh, the entire population, so to speak. True that, and uh, the other self-checkout, it's not convenient. But if you come with a convenient solution, I go and take my merchandise, I walk out with doing nothing. That's convenient. Because a person working in the supermarket, scanning, he or she is good at it, doing it much quicker, more efficiently, with much less errors than me. So it's a technology that for me, personally, is a dead end, unless I'm buying max three items. Um, that's, that's actually a very good example, I think. Think about it, uh, uh, this technology was uh, introduced in the UK probably 10 years ago. And when I came here and I said, hey, in London we have uh, self-checkout machines, they said, no way it will work in Central Eastern Europe. Everyone will be stealing, everyone will, it, it will be fraud, will be too high. I didn't know what to say to that because I'm Central Eastern <laughs> European. Um, uh, but uh, what we see now, now we see in the Asda stores, which is owned by Walmart, the biggest uh, supermarket in the world, we see three types of checkouts. You have traditional, you have self-checkout, and then you have gun or mobile phone checkout. So basically what I'm doing is I'm scanning every item by myself, putting it into baskets, and then I'll just pay with my mobile phone. That's it. And of course, we already have Amazon, where you just walk in, you take goods into your basket, I was testing it with my wife. I was uh, throwing my stuff into the same basket as she was throwing, and it worked. We just walked away. No one asked me anything. So there was no one in the store, just the security guy at the gate. So this is the future, and yes, we need to think of how quickly it will go, but example here, we have Tesco's here. We have self-checkouts here in Central Eastern Europe, so I'm not worried about having the adoption of this type of true, service. True that. Uh, Decathlon already used the technology. You put things in a bin and the RFID scans it. So put that in your shopping uh, trolley. Whatever it's called right. in American English. Um, and it scans automatically. The step is not that far away. And now we have a great automatic payment system that I do not think my generation would think that we're losing control over. If I may just add a little, thank you with, for the example with Amazon, because uh, scanning manually, myself doing scanning over three items can be time consuming, but this is the wrong product. That's not the evolution, that's like try, let's try, let's do this MVP. But walking into the store, putting everything into the bag and walking out, and either by cameras, by RFID or whatever technology, just walk away with paid and securely 
purchased items. That's the way. That's the innovation. And same as uh, there was a big discussion, and again, thanks for the example with uh, UK, with London, with Sainsbury, and they have been putting uh, automated, fully automated stores into some neighborhoods and not into some others. That's the bad neighborhoods. Let's not judge, but uh, okay, more crime, more stealing, and now they are everywhere because they evolved in that way that you can purchase items. They are secure. There is just this secure guy, who, security officer who knows that, oh, this was not checked out and, or not paid or there was not enough money on the card. Anyhow, anyhow, this person is running. But still, if the product is done good, well, then it's not a problem for nobody, for no generation, for no fraud. For all. Thank you, Peter. We're going to move on. How are emerging technologies on blockchain and distributed ledger technology shaping future payment service. I think this could be a question for the people in the crypto new payment solutions and so on. Why not? Could be, could be, it? yeah. Yeah, um, I think blockchain technology um, is, we, let's say uh, blockchain technology already exists a, lo a long time from a technical point of view. But now we have some challenges which, are, which we have to compete and we have to get used to it. Uh, the blockchain technology is combined with the digital ledgers and so on. It's decentralized. It means uh, we are not, this is not the common picture we have from payments. That means there is a central bank which is managing, which is making control and so on. So, every wallet, every um, people, they are connected. That means we, have, we need to have different monitoring tools. So it's, on the one hand, it's a very fast solution, it's a secure solution, but it, uh, it's, it's, let's say, there is space for fraud as well. And we have to compete against this fraud. We have to, to work and we have to get uh, uh, let's say we have to talk with traditional payment institutions, with traditional banks and so on, because they are not used at the moment to it. And, but you can be 100% sure that already every big player on the market, every bank is already working on blockchain technologies, because we think that this could be a solution for international transfers and for maybe... Um, replacing SWIFT payments. Because the monitoring tool and the monitoring companies like CoinFirm and so on, which, uh, and the travel rule and so on, this, this means we have already to, to think where, which wallets are blocked, which wallets are stolen. You know, just as an example, I always, uh, because we have a lot of discussions with our head of AML, with our MLRO, with our compliance team, uh, how can we monitor, how can we uh, understand this? And for example, there are a lot of blocked, uh, blocked wallets, uh, for example, in Germany, in, in uh, Berlin, there is a clan uh, who were uh, dealing with drugs. They have a big Bitcoin wallet and they're trying to bring it in the market to, to say to you, yeah, Bitcoin is at the moment 29,000 euros, for example. I give it to you for 15,000 in cash, you know? But then you have the problem because these wallets are flagged and you can do this. And you see the latest news from the US that they found out from Silk Road 10 years ago, you know? They found out uh, uh, different wallets which were blocked uh, with 1.2 million, a billion of euros and something like this. So there are monitoring tools, but it has to be, we have to talk with traditional payments, with fintech payments, and so on. And yeah, I think uh, blockchain is a good technology for the future. If I may add, there is a very important communication topic about either blockchain, digital ledger, or other distributed technologies. And that's the fact that we mostly connect them with payments itself. But blockchain is widely usable for other finance products, not just the payments itself, but fraud, threat intelligence sharing, pseudonymized data sharing, all escrow insurance services. You can find nearly everywhere a place where you could use distributed technologies and in the era where we will be trying to replace cash, which is a easily and pretty distributed technology, we will have for blockchain technologies wide variety of use 
far, far beyond payments itself. So let's never forget about utilizing blockchain and distributed technologies in other finance products because we are using it as a regulated and non-crypto capable entity widely for many products outside of payments itself. And we can see it all around the industry. So digital technologies will be one of the cores and uh, cornerstones of evolution of future payments and related finance products. I have just one quick comment there regarding the use of blockchain. Both the Swedish real estate register and car registers is registered in ledger on blockchain to avoid fraud mainly. Yeah, that was a perfect example. In several states, in the United States, there is the registry of ground uh, and uh, properties made already in blockchain, and there are far, far beyond finance uh, examples in pharmaceutics and others. So blockchain will be widely used because the distributed technology has its sense and we will, we will utilize it as much as we can. Another word goes to Branislav. So yes, and, and probably someone can have association that, oh, Visa and blockchain, it, it doesn't feel or it doesn't connect together. But actually, it's, it's uh, vice versa, because we embrace new technologies. We believe that if there is a new technology, we should utilize it. And uh, Visa is actually building on a blockchain, uh, B2B Connect uh, with IBM. And we are putting together banks into that network. And that network will exactly compete or will, will provide a competition for, for likes uh, Swift. Uh, that we hear from, from financial institutions where they complain to us about uh, un unclear uh, pathway of the money, uh, unclear timing of the money, chargebacks uh, from correspondent banking, FX trades that are not clear in the beginning. And that's the answer. Of course, whoever will come with the best solution for financial institutions will, will probably win this race, but uh, we embrace uh, blockchain. Thank you. So I, I believe blockchain is a great technology and I was fascinated by, by it from the very beginning. Uh, I think that it is especially useful when, uh, frankly speaking, you would like to replace trusted third party. And because we are trusted third parties here, uh, the benefits of this technology are a little bit limited. So what we see from Bitcoin success, for example, it couldn't be success in terms of usability, okay? That's the separate discussion we'll have uh, probably in a minute. But, uh, but that shows that in autonomous systems without the trusted third party, this technology is really doing the job which couldn't be done otherwise. If it is within a third party, like a bank, like an institution keeping records, uh, uh, it is not so attractive uh, also because um, the costs and problems with uh, processing a lot of data, it is not very efficient uh, technology in that regards. Uh, but I s definitely believe in digital currencies, especially central bank digital currencies, which are a little bit different thing that, uh, that blockchain itself. That's our next discussion, qu discussion question. That is, what role does digital wallets, mobile payment apps play transforming the way we make financial transactions that is connected to central bank digital currencies CBDC's impact on future payment service and monetary policy. We don't have anybody from the central bank here, so I guess we can skip the monetary policy part. But CBDC digital wallets, that's the main topic we we're going to continue with. Who wants to start? Yes, please. Yes, so uh, I'll also try to build a little bit on uh, what uh, uh, my colleagues said here. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, blockchain is used uh, or, or will be used for payments, but uh, it, uh, it uh, started the revolution with uh, CBDCs. Uh, because um, uh, for payments you have to have trust, and uh, if you don't have a, a 
trusted uh, third party there or central bank, it's, it's very difficult. So, so right now uh, there aren't uh, many uh, payments uh, made with, uh, with uh, 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 cryptocurrencies. This might change in the future, but exactly uh, a lot of central banks are, are uh, uh, experimenting with CBDCs. So that's, I think, the biggest contribution of, of blockchain that we can see uh, currently. And regarding wallets, uh, this is a very nice and convenient way for users to use them. So anyone who tried to make any transaction with a wallet can say that it's really, really convenient. You just connect your wallet, for example, in a browser, and with a, with a click uh, you, can, you can make a payment, which is really, really nice. Uh, but uh, again, uh, what our uh, what my colleagues here said, uh, you can use it for for other things as well. And uh, one of the things that I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, looking into is, for example, uh, digital identity, which can be used together with wallet. And that's uh, that's exactly a very nice use case that can make uh, life of people much easier. That is a good comment. Before we have like a digital ID that is accepted all over Europe, it makes it much more difficult to actually prove who you are and make transactions across borders and so on. We have different national systems. I have a Swedish bank ID. I can log into the tax office to my bank, to this and to that. That is useless outside the borders of Sweden, which makes it very limited since I live in Slovakia. So combining digital wallets, maybe, uh, Digital euros, which we had an interesting talk about here yesterday. We do digital wallets. You can use this and verify who you are. Yes, uh, this is one of the main topics our company is dealing every day. So, um, frankly speaking, um, 10 years ago, Daniel Mattes, um, he is uh, a very famous investor, uh, and he was developing in my home country, Jumio. And everybody thought from the traditional banking, why is he doing something like this? Why? Ten years ago, you know, it was not not like uh, 20 years ago or something like this. It's uh, just a short period. And there is a gap, you know. There is a gap in between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. From a technical point of view, you cannot even compare from the border of Slovakia, the Western countries. Digita uh, digital uh, or remotely onboarding, that's why so many companies are in Lithuania, uh, in Latvia, Estonia, Slovakia, and the Eastern countries. They are much more uh, using much more technology. We are dealing with paper IDs from Italy, you know? Our Lithuanian, uh, we are using Identify. Uh, our Lithuanian company, they, when they saw this the first time, they were like, what's that, you know? And we, but we have to use because there is ex expiry date on it. So this means uh, we are dealing every day with remotely onboarding, with life, life uh, detection, that means is this person really the person? Is it a fraud? Is it an, an identity fraud? Is this wallet connected to the right person? And so on. This means we have at the moment a really big gap in between Western Europe, Eastern Europe, or the Arabic area, because our, um, our headquarters is in Dubai. And uh, you know, when I enter the airport, everything is scanned. My retina is scanned. Uh, they say at the, at the border, they say, hi, Daniel. Yes. I don't have to do anything, you know, everything. If they are searching me, they find me. Okay, you can, you can, uh, you can say this is uh, maybe a picture you don't want to have, but it's uh, from, if you are in a legal framework, you, you don't have to be uh, uh, frightened that ever, uh, something is happening. So this remotely onboarding is a daily business, and this is where I completely agree with Gabriel, that older people don't have uh, the understanding to remotely onboarding. And I always say it's a difference um, that uh, the traditional banks, they're used to uh, say, yes, they get to know you in the first, in school, when you uh, 
uh, make your savings and uh, they leave you when you're dying, you know? But in the meantime, they understand your pay slip, you're, uh, you're renting a flat, you're buying a house, you're doing this, they have a picture about you better than your wife. You know, they, they understand everything about you. And then it's like, uh, now we have to, to, to do remote onboarding within seconds, minutes. And this is the challenge we have at the moment. And yeah, so I know why uh, Daniel was doing, uh, Daniel Mattis was doing Jumia, so right now. I will give one comment here first, onboarding, Online in Slovakia, you do it online, then they say they send the paperwork with the courier to your home, and you have to sign paper and show your ID card. Uh, I will comment both of you, gentlemen. You just had experience with bad product and bad company. Wouldn't ever happen with us. Fully digital onboarding, no papers. Uh, this is a big international bank. Big companies have bad products. And Daniel, thank you very uh, much for that example. I was leaving recently Qatar, and they asked me uh, after leaving, eh, how was your visit to Banana Island? I'm like, how the heck you know? So <laughs> yes, and with CBDC, this privacy aspect, and how much, who will know, and who will be able, who will be able to control is a big question. But uh, I, I will just, again, emphasize that, that uh, blockchain implementation or other distributed technology towards CBDC and towards crypto, it's something totally different. And I believe we are here experiencing something like, mm, many of you know the story of Spotify. And when they started to change heavily the music industry, many have been pointing fingers to them that they are next Pirate Bay. They are, again, some streaming services uh, doing something wrong, streaming uh, music illegally. And they brought totally new thing. And we will see uh, either different CBDCs. Uh, by the way, we have more than 14 central bank uh, issued digital currencies already operational across the globe. So I don't know if you touched it yesterday, but there are many new scenarios where you can see that it is working. And based on different of level of the blockchain technology, which is underneath, they have also additional services changed to the payments itself. But we are evolving. We could endlessly dispute the topic of uh, different cryptos and closed loop systems where you can have and achieve much higher security than in any level of uh, standard fiat money and like even theoretically. And for sure, for sure, we will evolve with CBDCs much further and we wouldn't be able to avoid it. it it's coming either this way or another. And let's see how we will interfere it. We as company try to bring it as a transparent as possible to our clients, but on the other hand, there will be changes coming and they will be pushed towards us from the regulatory. And we don't have, as you mentioned, regulatory here. Also, most probably nobody from SWIFT because we talked about replacing SWIFT here and there and so it would be nice. I don't think anybody from SWIFT is here, but if you are, <laughs> we'd like to hear your opinion. Uh, nothing bad about SWIFT now, but we discussed different things here. We covered uh, payments with the NFC near field technology, they're clipping cards and that belongs in the dinosaur pen or the, so on as well. It's going to be old fashioned very quickly. Uh, the next thing we can bring up here, Internet of Things on payment services. The smart payments. Uh, I mean, uh, we'll just give Tiny brief idea, what if my refrigerator automatically ordered food and paid for my food autom automatically and so on, as an example? Yeah, so we see this as a, as a really um, growing uh, part of the payment industry that, that your things will order uh, by itself uh, because you, you, will, uh, you will actually tell them to do so. Um, I have a really great example at home, you know, I have a printer and my printer actually 
uh, in goes to a 90% and then actually it sends message to the, I don't know what company he said, and, uh, and then they send, simply send me the, the new cartridge. I don't have to do anything. I'm just, I just put my card into their file, uh, card on file. It's, it's a perfect solution. I, I mean, like, before I went to Tesco's, I was identifying what printer I have, and, and just imagine that this is consumer solution. Now, imagine that you will have a company which will have the abilities like this, and actually suddenly in the company, you will start focusing on your core business, not on those kind of little issues. So suddenly you can automate so many things, and that's the beauty of, of payments. Very short example, if I may, from your, ho from your home country, and bringing uh, into the discussion what Dr. Daniel told, that there is a gap between countries in different parts of the world. I've been uh, living uh, in Nordic countries for a while, and it was, I think, seven years back in Sweden, there was a service in our village, a lawn mowing, and although it was not paid automatically, they entered our field. When they have been exiting, there was a uh, reader, some RFID technology, and from the, from the lawn mover device, uh, it measured how many square meters it did. And based on that, we were built. And uh, now, it could be paid automatically. And I think it will be a waste of similar examples with devices which measure what they did and how they should be paid. And, but let's see when and where it will come, because in some country, obviously, it might be cheaper to have it paid as a labor force and not even use technology, but sooner or later, we will automate it. In Sweden, there's very few people working in the non-qualified sector, so automation makes lots of sense. It's very difficult to find people to begin with, yeah. even if you want to pay them. I seen in a hospital there was a truck carrying dirty laundry. That truck costed more than a labor force in Central and Eastern Europe for two years. So you are giving a good example that if there is no enough labor, then most probably we will automate and pay. Uh, if I want to uh, add, I really like uh, the, the example that uh, Brian said about uh, printer ordering uh, the cartridge, it's, uh, it's uh, exactly a perfect use case for a device or, or a piece of software uh, purchasing something, yeah, buying something. Uh, and what I'm also uh, very excited about would be if uh, uh, this could be bi-directional, like not only devices buying something, but also getting paid. And uh, uh, giving an example would be, for example, uh, a weather station at my house, which collects uh, data, which might be useful for somebody else who might pay for it. Or for example, my car uh, parking space, which is in front of my uh, building, which somebody else might use. So that might be an interesting uh, thing too. My microphone ran out of the battery, so I'm borrowing this one now. And <clears throat> yes, we don't have to spend too much time on what your IoT can order for you and pay for it, but we can agree there's lots of different solutions in the area. And it will be developed clearly over time, and more and more things will come online and can provide services. And as somebody mentioned here, especially in B2B, where we should focus on our core business instead of spending so much time chasing toners or whatever we need. We should instead get work done. And imagine if you implement this in warehousing and other areas where there's a lots of work done uh, just by moving things around to knowing what you have. Now let's move on to biometric authentication methods, facial recognition, fingerprint scanning. We heard a little bit about Dubai already and the opportunities there. In Europe, we have GDPR and other privacy legislation, um, probably making this more difficult to automate it, but with the customer's consent, to your principle of uh, legal to store the customer data as long as it's stored securely. And for payment and banking services, I think, think biometrics makes perfect sense. I would like to hear some comments from our panel regarding biometrics. Obviously, we need some sort of electronic ID tied to the biometrics as well, I suppose. So, because the biometrics alone uh, with no identity to it is useless. So how can this solve payments and banking services? 
especially for, I would say, cross-border transaction, more complex transaction, where you really need to know who you're dealing with. I will start. So definitely we are uh, already, probably all of us, using uh, biometry, uh, using our phones. And uh, that's uh, the future because that's very convenient. Uh, definitely we should be very careful about those data. So the way it is now implemented is that you have a special chip on your mobile where the data is stored and couldn't be retrieved. Uh, because compromitation of those data would be a disaster because that would be the, the picture of my fingerprint and then I will compromise my finger but I couldn't change my uh, finger like a password. So, so definitely it's a very, very, very uh, sensitive uh, data. Uh, and coming back to uh, these automatic payments, um, just one sentence, I think that this use case is already uh, supported uh, and we have, because it is very similar to subscriptions, those uh, automatic payments will be technically from a payment perspective will be like a subscription. So as a customer, I think that uh, the, the thing which we would need is just one place where we see all those automatic uh, payments and subscriptions. So if it is a world where you have uh, those subscriptions in different places and if you would like to uh, uh, cancel any of them you should go to different places then it is challenging so 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 uh, definitely from a customer perspective that that will be uh, important and finishing with biometry yes we are using that and and it will be uh, more and more popular Yes, please. For sure, biometrics has its sense and has its reason, but I think we are talking about something where we are already far beyond. For me, biometrics is something as a password from cybersecurity perspective, and 90% of the attacks are not using stolen passwords. They are using the social engineering that they know about the possible targets. And here we have much more to protect, but not only our biometrics, our fingerprint or face trial scan, but we have all our automatically gathered behavior analysis. There are multiple systems now using AI, um, a lot of them not mature enough and not working with data before we have AI act safety enough and securely enough. So we have GDPR, okay, we have biometrics there, but there is much broader area with the full behavior al uh, analyst of each of us, which can be easy abused even easier than the biometrics itself. So biometrics is a must as a use and as a thing to protect, but we already have much more things to be taken care about. Thank you. Should we drop biometrics now and move over to one other very important question? Uh, financial inclusion, non-banked customers. Customers also have payment needs because in a large portion of the world, including Slovakia, there is a fairly large percentage of people are either non-banked or underbanked. So how do payment services contribute to financial inclusion and what measure can be taken to ensure access for underserved populations? You can start this time. Uh, yes, uh, this is one, one very important point which uh, can be solved through fintechs. And we are, for example, we are uh, touched by Africa. We are touched by the Asian market. And we have a lot of people, especially female, who have no access to bank account. In some countries, it's not allowed for a female to have a bank account, in Africa, for example, or in some countries of Africa. So a fintech which makes your mobile phone to, to your wallet, to your bank account for daily usage. Uh, this is for sure a, a, an extremely support of people in countries and in regions where banking is not, where not everybody has an access to a, to a, a bank account. So for me, um, uh, the new technologies, crypto and so on, for, just for example, in 
uh, DR Congo, uh, Litecoin is used as currency. This is the currency they have. They're using it. Um, one uh, kingdom in Africa, he was now asking to onboard in our com uh, company because for one million of his, I don't know to say, uh, in his kingdom, they want, uh, they have an... They're called subjects. <laughs> no, I'm a subject, I'm going to see the Swedish <laughs> king, and I do not see any pejoratives to be a subject of the king. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but uh, they have a currency which is really very, very weak. And, and through using uh, the, the blockchain, the, the wallet and so on, they, they can be introduced to, for example, the euro coin, to the US dollar coin or something like this. They, they have a stable coin which they can use for daily use without using the national bank. And they can make payments. They have, uh, for them, it's a kind of security as well. So for me, uh, it's a big support for these people. Yeah, well, innovation plays a super important role here. Of course, uh, if you create, uh, especially telecoms in Africa actually created wallets, so they don't have bank accounts, but they have telephones. And so basically they came with the idea how to utilize telephone as a bank account uh, or, or actually account for them. Uh, so, so this is one way of innovation. Of course, innovation could be that you, you create application that is really playful and, and that motivates actually people. But if we come to the, our region, I think what I was really surprised because last uh, two weeks ago I was in Prague on, on some conference and, and banks actually uh, took actual responsibility for financial education and I see now a lot of uh, projects within banks which are uh, going to the schools and presenting and, and bringing that financial education live, including Visa. And, and we feel responsibility because sometimes we teach kids when was the world war and I don't know what, and they come out of the schools and they don't know how to operate with their finances. So I think this is a big responsibility from our side. Thank you. Now over to Gabriel. Gabriel, sorry. <laughs> I'll just another example from our region. We started in Africa. Uh, there's a surprisingly large population of pensioners in Slovakia who are uh, underserved without any bank account. So they go to get their pension uh, in the post office every month and there's a certain fee that is taken away from them by the social security. And there's a company in Slovakia who is also licensed in Lithuania, uh, the electronic money institution license, uh, who is starting a project. They already have uh, three ATMs. So ATMs around Slovakia, they are studying in small villages and district towns, and they are placing these ATMs in uh, usually these city halls or town halls, uh, where the pensioners can come and collect their uh, pension with a little bit lower fee. It's not, I think, 12 euros, but it's five. But, you know, for a pensioner who received three, 400 euros pension, the difference is uh, meaningful. And I think this is another way, another answer to this question. It's, again, fintech, it's technology. So ATMs that we know of, you know, for the last decade, they haven't changed much. But I think the potential of ATMs is much broader uh, with technology such as uh, POS terminals. And, you know, you can be sending payments, receiving payments. And, uh, for example, this particular company I'm talking about, they decided to serve the uh, pensioners, which is maybe not uh, the first, you know, um, population group that you would think of uh, if you want to make money. But uh, if you break it down, there's a lot of them and the, uh, the fee that you can earn, it's significant. Plus, if you offer additional services and uh, you know, expand to other groups, this could be a, a good case. I want to say one thing. The audience, if you scan this QR code or go to FinWeek on Slido, you can ask questions. I'll get them on the mobile phone here, and I will give your questions to the panel. Okay, we have about 14 minutes left and we can use last 10 minutes for questions if you have any. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, I have two examples from inclusion perspective. One is the bright and the other is the dark side. From the bright side, not sure how many of you know the, the story of cryptocurrencies and their adoption by homeless people who are underbanked, no banks opening them bank accounts. And in many towns, the large towns, there were huge, huge amounts of adoption of cryptos because there were some ATMs, there are 
uh, possibilities how to get via some uh, uh, third party network to exchange crypto for cash, that homeless people have been using crypto as the place where they save their money at the end. Uh, then there is also the inclusion from the dark side. We, all of us here, are enabling payments and financial services to be much more approachable, including loans, including fast payments, including supporting automated loans in e-commerce, in shopping spree, like let's spend as fast as possible. But with this comes also place for fintechs uh, in the responsibility area, because you know that if you will enable your kids to spend money automatically, easily, you need to put in place some controls, or even your wife or husband, no offense. And then there is a place, uh, we already touched the topic of control, but here I am talking more about automated control, about taking the responsibility that if you are providing a tool which enables something to be more accessible, also take, uh, take good care that it is not abused or used too much. And that brings us into um, CBDCs and the retirees or pensioners that are unbanked. What if they get directly from the pension authorities digital euros straight into their wallet on their phone and they would pay no fees at all? Could that be a solution for the pensioners but maybe not so much for the payment providers? <laughs> This is, for example, um, a goal which we have uh, for the next time or near period. This is, I've, from my point of view, a very close connection in between traditional payments like Visa, uh, where you, for example, get the, the CBDs into your wallet and the wallet is directly funded on, an, uh, on your uh, virtual uh, card, Visa card, for example, which is you can make, can make the payment with NFC, where you can go to the uh, ATM with NFC, and so on. But uh, this includes a lot of uh, developments from my point of view, because uh, I can, mostly in Austria, there are not so many ATMs where you can uh, use it with NFC, because they have some old machines and so on. So this means uh, a development and a communication in between different stages of the payment or different stages of the money. But from my point of view, it's a very good development, and, but we have to think one step ahead and uh, make this connection. To begin with, the digital euro is at least five years into the future. 28 earliest, there will be a digital euro. We heard from the panel discussion we had yesterday with people from the EU Commission and so on. Maybe it will take till 2013 it's here, because they want to make sure to make it right, not quick. Any other comments? Yes, please, Gabriel. We, no, sorry. Peter. Yes. Well, we will be waiting for digital euro for a while, but we will see prototypes as a Krona, for example, or others. And also there will be parts of automation. Let's see when PSD3 comes, because this will enable fintechs to operate directly with cash in ATMs. It will enable fintechs to work with bank accounts, based on tokenization. So we will pay from your bank account as you pay with your Apple or Google wallet. No any more redirection during initiation of payments all the times. This will enable B2Bs to automatically work with their money as with data. So even before digital euro, where it's still questionable what features the blockchain underneath will bring, if there will be smart contracts and at what, what level, or we will have some side blockchain as they have with digital yuan in China. But still, there will be a few interim steps for security, as DORA, for payments, as PSD3, and possible automation in between we reach digital currency. One quick question. When will we actually have PSD3? I, I would need to be, this is about my pay grade. <laughs> I understand. OK, that's, that, that's a very straightforward answer. Because many in the industry is waiting and waiting. Th that's true. But I think it's shaping much faster than digital euro. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, please. I don't think that uh, the digital euro will solve uh, this problem of financial inclusion because uh, uh, what 
I think it's a real challenge that uh, this, the, the barriers are uh, actually the byproduct of enormous progress we see in payments. So uh, things are for us very simple, but for the older generation, for example, uh, it may be challenging or even uh, totally uh, unacceptable. I have a grandmother and she will not use a mobile and definitely any wallet on mobile will not solve uh, her uh, problems because she is not using mobile at all. So those people are, were grown up uh, uh, with cash and probably cash for a while will be still the only option for this kind of, of people. I completely agree. I mean, my father, he pays with his Visa card, but he would never start paying with a smartphone. He doesn't even know how to use a smartphone. But he understands a Visa card very well. Because he's a Western European, had a Visa card for a long time. We've got some questions from the audience here. So if you please give a very quick reply, we can start with the audience questions. This was just to sentence this comment. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Daniel will give more examples, but it's not necessary to use your mobile for digital currency, as it is not required to use mobile for crypto payments. We can have WooShares, cards, many, many other ways, which will be perfectly working fine for elderly or children. And you will still put in all the control. So I think it's not a problem with the mobile. Thank you. Now we have questions from the audience at last. That's really good. Thank you, audience, for the questions. So far, I have two questions. We start with the first one that came in first. How do you see the future of e-commerce payments? It's a very broad question. And I would like to give that question to maybe two, max three people. We'll start over here. So uh, one big trend that we see right now uh, are, are shoppable videos, which uh, are really shaping uh, 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 the, the e-commerce space. And uh, platforms are experimenting with them. So we saw TikTok uh, launched shoppable videos a uh, couple of months ago, I think, or weeks ago, where uh, some uh, influencer might be presenting some, uh, some product and you can tap directly into the uh, video and, and buy the product, which is very convenient for the user and uh, also like kind of encourages these impulse buys. Uh, and we see other platforms uh, also uh, experimenting with that. So uh, YouTube is, for example, also launching uh, uh, tools that help uh, creators uh, uh, sell things, for example, through videos. So this is one big uh, uh, topic that I see right now in e-commerce. Thank you, Josef. And the word goes to Peter. Very short one. Uh, payments will disappear from the flow of e-commerce purchase. They will not be there anymore. You will put things into your cart, you will like things in the video, you will purchase them by selecting them. The payments will be happening underneath, but it will be totally invisible to the buyer. Thank you. And on top of this, actually, this mixture of what is online and what isn't online, we will actually, we see, for example, now you will have a face-to-face -face experience by you basically paid online. So that, 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 that is kind of going to be mixed. And on, otherwise, uh, on the other side, uh, this, this will actually evolve this way. Um, so we know even about the big supermarket that basically implement this type of uh, trans online transactions. Thank you, Branislav. We continue with the second question. Tokenization, the way forward in payments. Tokenization, the way forward in payments. So Branislav, please. Yeah, so tokenization is obviously uh, the security procedure where we do not want our credentials to be exposed. That's a very clear pathway. We did it for many years already, and, and yet yeah, this is just continuing. So now uh, everything that you put out to any databases, whatever you are building, you try to tokenize the credentials so these are not stolen, and this, this is just going to be continued. Anybody else? Yes, please. Michal. Frankly speaking, I'm not sure if card concept uh, will be forever with us because you can imagine a world uh, without the concept of, of, of card, especially that in e-commerce it is uh, virtual. That, 
the, just just the data uh, which which uh, describe this this product. Coming back to e-commerce, I think that conversion uh, is very important for uh, merchants, and uh, it will be not always automatic because you will always have uh, shops which you trust to do a bit less and and, and, and paying automatically everywhere. I don't. I uh, believe uh, it is uh, a future regarding card world, uh, yes, tokenization definitely increase uh, the, 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 the safety of those products because without that, uh, compromising the card number would be, uh, would be really a high risk. Yes, please, please, please add something. And then we go to the next question. Tokenization doesn't mean that we com tokenize card, right? Tokenization means that we are actually converting any credentials, right? So that's that's very important to understand. Um, yeah, and this is happening. Okay. What is the biggest challenge for providers to include cryptocurrencies as payment method? I think that's a question for somebody over here. Okay, please, Peter. Regulation is the simple answer. Okay. And Dr. Daniel? Monitoring. Transaction monitoring. monitoring and regulation, yeah. Okay. And uh, Michael, please. I would add uh, UX. I don't want to go very much into technical details, but uh, with this cryptography, uh, which should be used for, uh, for crypto products, it is not intuitive and easy at all. And if you would like to build a modern uh, UX over that you, you simplify and actually deposit the private key in some trusted institution which uh, questions the whole uh, idea a little, a little bit. It is the same story with uh, the, the, the public key cryptography used for, for digital certificates. And one more comment from Dr. Daniel, then I'll the ask the last question. It's not only the monitoring, but uh, at the moment, uh, the hardest thing to deal with is a uh, source of fund. From where do you have your currency? From where do you have your USDT? So uh, just imagine people were uh, mining uh, cryptos at university in 2013, for example. They don't uh, even think about uh, in this time to, to make a screenshot, for example, that they were doing this. Uh, colleagues from mine, they were uh, in the night when the university was closed, they were running all the, the university computers to mine their, their, their cryptos uh, in this time. So uh, what should they say? Yeah, uh, we were using the computer of the university, and uh, but we don't have a protocol for this. So this will be a big challenge uh, for old, to uh, old tokens and old coins, but now it's to understand how to, to, to how to find the source of fund, a proof of wealth, or something like this, uh, and to understand the cryptos. Now the last question, really quick. What do you think about metaverse and payments? Okay, Peter. I, I believe that metaverse is even better example than e-commerce, where automated and transparent payments would be happening. You will have connected whatever kind of your wallet, your assets, your crypto, I believe Mark will support whatever money you want to give him, and you will pay flawlessly. And Michael, and we can have, we can have one more comment after Michael on this if somebody is interested. Dr. Daniel, it, so regarding metaverse, uh, my comment is that we'll just see how popular it will be, because my personal experience is that a couple of years ago we had a second life uh, hype. And uh, frankly speaking, I was uh, traveling a lot and speaking at conferences about this second life virtual world, and that was a very fascinating uh, topic. But uh, nothing <laughs> came from, from that, and that was quite a similar, not technologically not so advanced, uh, of course, solution, but uh, yes, you can buy your home uh, or, or your yacht in the second life, so the idea was similar. When I think about metaverse, I always get in mind e -Wally, the movie, where the people have with their glasses and they, they live in a, in a virtual world. But uh, two weeks ago, I was confronted with uh, a guy who was establishing the first travel platform 
uh, in the world. It's, I think it's about 20, 25 years ago, which was reducing the prices. And he was talk, uh, he's from Stanford University, and I, I was talking with him, and he said, yeah, Metaverse, there are so many people in Asia who cannot afford to go to Bali, to the, to the, to the beach, to make a jet ski or to rent it. They go through the Metaverse. This is a big, huge market you cannot even imagine. And he's... Uh, building up a new company with 150 people, just IT, making Bali, buying this and doing everything. And the people pay, pay, pay. And uh, they they live in a, in a virtual world, uh, maybe um, running away from the reality. Thank you. And thanks to the panel. And uh, in the break, you will get a chance to ask questions to them at the coffee tables. A big thank you to the panel members. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Gabriel Stefaniak. I'm actually born and raised in uh, Bratislava, Slovakia. But for the nine, uh, last nine years, I've been living in Riga, Latvia, which is a bit more north, a bit more cold. And my beautiful wife is also Latvian, and I have two kids there who are like half Slovak, half Latvian. Uh, is there anyone else with kids here? Fantastic. Then probably we have few things in common, and one of the main one is that we lack two commodities the most, or we wish we had uh, two of the you know most lack commodities more of, which is time and money. And today in uh, my uh, short case study, I will show you one way or a couple of ways how you can save significant portion of time and money uh, if you are in a digital banking business. So let's start with a few trends. Uh, we have talked about a few here, uh, perhaps yesterday more. Uh, I understand that not all the trends are here to stay, not all the trends are here to replace legacy solutions, and not all the trends are here to, to be the next big thing. But there are definitely trends uh, that may disrupt the industry and we should pay attention to. And here's the short list of trends that we have identified that are currently emerging and are quite important. Let's take, for example, ChatGPT, which is more of a hype than a trend at the moment, where companies are playing with it mostly on the back end, but I think the brave ones probably on the front end with communication with the customer and so on. Then uh, cloud computing, it's been here for a while. Companies are using it uh, for obvious reasons to be you know, running their solutions in different jurisdictions than they are physically present because of some uh, regulations. For example, open banking, that's a huge one, uh, probably more prevalent in the Nordic countries where I am based and uh, Scandinavia, but probably it will, it will be more prevalent in, in, in this region, basically allowing, like one of the most common use cases, it allows the consumer to check out from an uh, e-shop or e-commerce platform, basically directly connecting uh, him to his bank account and making a checkout very seamlessly, which was unimaginable just a few years ago. And super apps, uh, that's maybe in Asia for the last decade, they've been uh, using super apps. Uh, I cannot really identify one in Slovakia, but you know, in a few years, uh, maybe Bolt has the potential if they do some embedded finance and um, embedded uh, whatever. And there are two buzzwords, banking as a service and banking as a platform. I will describe a bit more in the Next slide. If you want to be successful in any business, especially financial business, you have to be able to identify the trends and perhaps uh, implement them and also listen to what the customer is saying. So what the customer say, expects nowadays is your solutions to be up and running 24-7, uh, website and the, the mobile platform to be intuitive. Uh, he wants the customer support to be very helpful, not hanging, you know, not, le not letting you hang on the line for that 30 minutes. Then uh, they connect you to another customer support uh, employee and uh, you spend another 10 minutes explaining the issue. So everything should be intuitive, seamless, and up and running. You probably can feel the same when you are a customer of a bank. You want your funds to be secure, executed instantly. Uh, and at, this, at least that's what I expect uh, from, my, from my bank. Uh, who is better positioned nowadays to identify the trends, innovate, and implement uh, you know, what the customer is expecting? Is it the legacy banking uh, system, which has a uh, longer decision-making process because it's just uh, 
more people, more institutions, uh, different focus on different generations, and it's usually with a lot of physical branches, or is it the, let's say, lean or innovative uh, fintech companies? You probably feel, what is the answer? I'm not saying one is better the, than the other, because if it wasn't for the you know, uh, rigidity of the, of the legacy banking system, there wouldn't be any, any innovative fintech companies and vice versa. If, you know, uh, fintech companies were perfect, we still wouldn't be receiving salaries to our bank accounts and, of course, using uh, credit services. Now, coming back to the initial proposition of saving time and money, if you are in the business or you are deciding to enter the business of uh, digital banking or you want to start your neo bank or challenger bank, which as I mentioned already in the panel discussion is quite popular in the Baltic states and the Nordic countries because of the licensing takes place and a lot of these neo banks are licensed in Lithuania. Then you are looking probably at uh, several years of development and of course several probably hundreds of thousands of euros, if not millions, depending on how complex your solution is. And you have to consider time to market uh, when you want to deploy the solution and start doing the business because this is quite crucial. If it's three, four, five years, you are looking at uh, different trends and different expectations and then you have to start all over again and invest more and more money. So it's sort of never ending process. If you decide to outsource this, you basically have two options. Banking as a service and banking as a platform. Uh, the former, it's for license uh, for non-licensed institutions. So banking as a service, essentially, you find a banking partner who gives you uh, the license to operate your banking solution, and also they give you the technology. So the time to market is rather short, but of course it comes with significant limitations, uh, such as on the number of products and services that you offer or you want to offer also some innovations, if you want to innovate, you may be blocked by the banking partner, as well as some customizations, that, that's a huge challenge. Uh, you are always relying on the banking partner. And of course, uh, you don't have the control over the compliance, compliance policy, what uh, customers they are approving, etc. So the other option is digital banking platform. Uh, so this banking is a platform, basically. It's for licensed entities who already have a license. It can be banking license. EMI license, EMD license, and so on. And uh, it gives you all the technology that you need uh, to run your own bank. In DECTA, we said bring our license and we give you a turnkey solution to uh, run your own digital bank. In short, it looks something like this. You know, your branded website, customer comes in, he fills out the identification um, registration form, which is fully online. Then uh, he uploads the documents, which is again online, and he verifies himself and other UBOs in case you're doing B2B. And of course, everything is done through modules such as uh, SAMSAP. Uh, then there's electronic signature implementation uh, and integration. Uh, so it's quite uh, quite fast process. Uh, of course, this uh, platform gives or makes the life for your compliance rather easy because there are integrated compliance modules which download data from the open registrar or open data registrar uh, and directly uh, uploads it to your systems and you are able to basically approve a client with already all the answers received by your compliance officers. You can change the compliance policy in the compliance module and so on. So all of this is fully white labeled. Once the customer is approved, he goes to his uh, self-service uh, interface, which is basically the desktop version and the mobile app. And of course, uh, that looks like a regular e-banking with payments coming in and out, Forex, ordering cards, receiving cards, fro freezing cards, uh, and so on. There's also the uh, white label payment gateway if you want to service merchants and so on, and of course uh, everything is uh, compliant with the latest regulations. Just to sum it all up, basically, uh, developing a, a digital banking software is uh, rather challenging, time consuming, and costs a lot of money. Time to market is a big challenge, because usually developing such a software is very time consuming, and the trends and customer expectations are changing. And the proposition is basically to be 
different and if you want to differentiate, differ, differentiate uh, uh, you want to be on the market fast, then Dekta is offering digital banking platform uh, ready in nine months. If you want to discuss it further, I'll be happy to have a chat. Otherwise, thank you for your attention. And, uh, have a nice rest of the day or conference. Thank you very much for this very good presentation, Gabriel. And I really believe off-the-shelf solutions, COTS, that is the future, unless you're really, really large with a big balance sheet and want your own solutions. But for smaller players, COTS, that is the solution. <laughs>